Remember that chapter? Verse 34, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you do love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't we, I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And then Jesus answered him, will you really lay down your life for me? Because see, as we approach Christmas, that's exactly why Jesus came to this earth, to lay down his life for you, so that you could have the hope, the peace, the joy that Jesus Christ brings. You can't experience that otherwise. You try to go through this life on your own power, and you'll go right back to the bickering and the griping and the not loving your neighbor. It's impossible. If you've read your Old Testament, you'll see that over and over again. If you've lived any experience of life, you'll experience and live that over and over again. But Jesus expected us to have a much better way. That's why he came and died. He really expected us to love one another. So I was thinking that maybe if we talked about this a little bit before the message, that it would be a good illustration for you. Some of you have asked me what I learned at the marriage conference. I learned about toilet paper. Is there a right and wrong way to put on toilet paper? Yes. We're going to solve this problem right here now. Is there a right and wrong way to put on toilet paper? Do you put it on this way? Let me get it to go. Does it roll off this way? Or does it roll off this way? Hold on. Or does it matter? It does matter, okay? Does it matter how you live? It does matter. Jesus gave the commandment. See, the people who made, you can't tell it from the toilet paper holder. You can't tell it from the roll that's in here. And they constantly change the jumbo size and the width of the rolls and everything else to fake you out. But the people who designed toilet paper designed it with a pattern on it. So the pattern is supposed to roll off where you can see it. See, Joy? The designer designed it in a specific way, to be used in a specific way. God designed you to be in a loving relationship with him and with each other. And Jesus came to this earth and died for us so that we would live that way, so that people really would know we are Christians by our love. Marianne, you're up. Today is 1 Corinthians 12, 7 and 1 Corinthians 12, 11, 17. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Just as a body through one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so at, for we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Okay, now you got a message. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for the spirit that seals us for when Jesus Christ returns, for when we meet him face to face. Lord, we thank you that Jesus would give up heaven to come and live a humble life and then lay down that life for us, setting forth a pattern for us to live, giving us hope that we never had before, giving us peace that passes all understanding, giving us joy that we could never comprehend, even in a world of suffering and turmoil and pain, we can find those things in Jesus Christ. Lord, through the power of your Spirit, let us live lives that bring you glory and honor. For when the day that we meet Jesus, that we will hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. We pray this in his precious name. Amen.
So 1 Corinthians 12, 31 says this, But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I will show you a more excellent way. You should have read 1 and 2 Corinthians this week. You read some of the letters to the churches now in the order that they were most likely written. You've read, Gal you've read Galatians. You've read First and Second Thessalonians. You've read James. I don't have them in the exact order. I'm trying to come off of memory. And you've read First and Second Corinthians. You're starting Romans now. You see a pattern already in the church, don't you? You see a world that won't necessarily know Christians by their love. Christians that were persecuted, driven from their homes for their beliefs, sold their property and shared things in common, but still showed favoritism to one another. Decided they'd meet with this person and eat with this person, but they wouldn't with this person. What's wrong with that picture? And it's still the picture today. We are to love one another as Christ loved and gave His life up. There is no difference, Jew or Greek, anything else. You received God's loving grace because it was a free gift when you chose to believe Him. None are righteous by their works, no, not one. But if you believe, then you are a new creation in Christ and you will definitely have the Spirit which sealed you, producing gifts as you grow in maturity. And you can read what those gifts are, and we had a little song about it if you can remember them again. But you'll see those things developing in you. So we read these letters, and Paul, as he's writing this letter to the Corinthians, says, man, I wish I could talk to you in a way that wasn't as babes in Christ. And I still can't. And if you read these letters, you realize reading them that this wasn't first, Paul's first letter to 1 Corinthians, to the Corinthian church at Corinth, even though it says it's 1 Corinthians, because he says, in your previous letter, let me answer this, in your previous thing. So 1 Corinthians is at least his second letter to them. When you got into 2 Corinthians, he talks about a harsh letter. Maybe 1 Corinthians was that letter, maybe it wasn't. Maybe there was a third. So maybe there was four letters here, maybe more. There's at least three, but we've got 1 and 2 Corinthians. We don't have the others. We don't know all the details. But this letter was designed to be read aloud to the church, and it is addressing the church in this case because of their behavior. And it starts out with the fact that, oh, let me just read it to you. I'm skipping, Kim. <laughs> to 1 Corinthians 1, 4 through 7. It says, I always thank my God for you because of His grace given you in Christ Jesus, for in Him you have been enriched in every way with all kind of speech and with all kind of knowledge, God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. You have no excuse. If you are a Christian, you should act like a Christian. If you don't act like a Christian, there's a good possibility that you aren't a Christian. I can't say it any clearer than that. And I don't care if you like that phrase or not. I'm here to shepherd you, to be your shepherd, as Jesus shepherds me. We're here to work together. We're here to use our spiritual gifts to build up the church, not tear it down. And especially going into Christmas, people are going to be looking at us to see why we say that we celebrate this Christ, this Jesus who was a good teacher and everything, but surely he wasn't God. The same dilemma that the people faced when Jesus Christ came. Did many miraculous proofs, and yet people still nailed him to a cross to die. Because we don't want to take ourselves off the, the throne. You know what you read in James? In Galatians, this is what Paul, Galatians, this is what Paul has already said to that church in Galatians 5, verses 13 through 17. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. And I know if you're like me, I think I don't indulge in the flesh. Every time I get angry and say something that I shouldn't say, I'm indulging in the flesh because that's what my flesh wants to do. It doesn't mean all those things that these other pagans do. It means anything that is a sin. Not loving my neighbor is a sin because Jesus Christ set the pattern for me.
But do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, here's how you're supposed to use your freedom. To serve one another humbly in love. Wow. <laughs> That's what I'm supposed to do with this new freedom is to die to myself and live for others. For the entire law is fulfilled by keeping this one command. One thing, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. Verse 16, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want to do. If you have Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have Jesus Christ as your Lord. You are to do what He tells you to do. You have been purchased with a price, the price of Jesus' death on the cross to save you from your sins. That's why Jesus came. That's why we celebrate Christmas. That's why there is no greater time of joy and peace on this earth for those who found favor to, with God through Jesus Christ. Back to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 31. Paul said, because they're struggling and quarreling over everything, including spiritual gifts. They say they have spiritual gifts, but they're not using them to build up the body. They're fighting over them. So I want to read you some other translations of that. The King James Version said, But earnestly desire the best gifts. He doesn't tell them not to desire the gifts, but des desire the best gifts, whatever that is. And yet I'll show you even a more excellent way. Now let me remind you, that's the last verse in chapter 12. What is chapter 13? The love chapter, right? That's the more excellent way. If you just love, as we just read in Galatians, all the law is summed up here. If you love one another, then you know God's love and you are revealing it to the world and you're showing them the way, the truth, and the life. If you love one another. Well, the English Standard Version says it this way, but earnestly desire the higher gifts instead of the better gifts. And I will show you a still more excellent way. So it puts a little more emphasis still. The NIV Version says, Now eagerly desire the greater gifts and I will show you the most excellent way. The New Living Translation says, So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. The reason the Spirit gave you gifts is to build up the body of Christ. Do any of you, let me ask the three ladies, do any of you like walking around with something to aid you? No, you want the body to function properly. And we have gifts that we've been giving each other to help the body function properly so that it can be, do its goal. The hands and feet of Jesus Christ to the world. Reconciling men to God. Wow, what a task we've been given. Let me finish the New Living Translation. So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts, but now let me show you a way of life that is best of all. Love, love, love. Don't get hung up on the first verses of 1 Corinthians because then you'll get stuck on the, if I could speak of angels. No, that's not the point. The point is love. Paul is saying, even if I could speak every known tongue, which is one of the things they're offer, uh, arguing about, or I could speak angelic speech, it doesn't matter. I'm a sounding gong, a clanging cymbal. It doesn't matter. Without love, I am bankrupt. I put some of the messages... Uh, translation of love in your bulletin so you can remember those things. Because love is a choice. Love is not a funny feeling. Love is something I choose to do. Sherry and I celebrated our 31th, 31st anniversary, 31st, 30, 31st anniversary in Hawaii. You know why we did? Because I chose to love her. And because I have God's love in me, I can love her when she's unlovable and she can love me when I'm unlovable. And let me tell you, that happens. Probably more than it should. But I can continue to love her because I choose to love her and I'm sure it works probably more the other way. It's not a funny feeling. It's a choice to keep no records of wrong. To love even when they're unlovable. To love as Christ loved.
If you read on in Galatians chapter 5, Paul said to that church, but if you are led by the Spirit, that's opposed to not being led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Okay, sexual immorality, I'm okay. Impurity, debauchery, I'm okay. Idolatry, witchcraft, I'm okay. Hatred, well, you're getting a little close. Discord, <laughs> jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition. Boy, I'm going to miss that one then for sure. Dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. None of you can say you marked all those off. None is righteous, no, not one. But those are the fleshly acts. I warn you, as I did before. Oh, Paul had to warn that church before. That those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is, what's first? Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such these things there is no law. There doesn't have to be a law. There is no thou shall not. If you love your neighbor as yourself, as Christ loved the church, there won't be any thou shall nots. Hey, that's kind of what heaven's going to be like, isn't it? Verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Paul's letter to the th th church in Thessalonica. I'm showing you these things so you see this pattern. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 8, it is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable. Okay, i am just heard of sexual immorality, so I'm controlling my body because I'm not going out and, con and uh, con conducting myself in wild orgies. I'm not controlling my mouth when I say, Man, I hate you. You shouldn't have done that either, am I? I'm not controlling my body. Didn't James say the tongue was the smallest member of the body? And who can control it? But yet it's like the rudder of a large ship. You ever seen a cruise ship? Seen the rudder back there? It's tiny compared to that ship. But it turns that ship wherever it wants to go. So don't just read the surface here, but read the message here. Verse 5, not in a pas passionate lust like the pagans do, who do not know God, and that, and that in this matter no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. Oh, I missed that before when I was concentrating on the not participating in orgies, wasn't I? No, not to take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish those who commit such sins. As we told you and warned you before. Remember that? from Galatians, so we're seeing this in Corinthians, I keep warning you because we keep trying to live by the flesh rather than by the Spirit. When you get to Ephesians, he's going to write it out. We fight a spiritual battle. Put on the whole armor of God instead of putting on your armor to try to defend. And if you put on the armor of God, you will extinguish all the fiery darts of the devil. Verse 7 for God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being but God, the very God who gave you His Holy Spirit. If you drop down a few verses of verse 13, But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. I can say this about the church in Corinth. At least they realized there were spiritual gifts. Because if you talk to a lot of Christians today, do you have any spiritual gifts? No, nah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think so. Well, as we read on, we'll see that every Christian has been given the Spirit. And the Spirit gives gifts to every Christian as he sees fit for building up the body of Christ. So yes, you have a spiritual gift. If you don't know what it is, maybe think about going and ask someone else. And maybe they've seen a glimpse of it, but you just don't realize it. You have a spiritual gift, and it is used to build up the body of Christ. <clears throat> Verse 14 says, He called you to this through our gospel, that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's in heaven preparing a place for you. 
So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace give us eternal encouragement and good hope. Encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every word that you say to others. You got it up there, Kim, or you don't have it up there? Okay. Well, it'd help if you had it up there. But it doesn't say that in every word that you say to others. It says in every good deed and word. You can't just tell them about Jesus and then live any way you want to. doesn't work. They have a name for you when you do that. What is it? Hypocrite. <laughs> Good, you passed that Christian 101 etiquette. If you go on to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 6, it says, In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive. Huh. And does not live according to the teachings you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you. Verse 11 says, We hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy. They are busy bodies. And then if you read in Corinthians, you'll realize that Paul said to cast someone out who was committing sexual sin. He said to cast them out so that Satan could destroy their body, but God could save their soul. See, that's why Jesus said to Peter, He said, Get behind me, Satan. Because Peter thought he was doing right by defending Jesus physically. But Jesus came so that he would die on the cross. So even in these sins, even the devil, even the demons, even every spiritual darkness is used to draw men to Christ. But you are called to be a light to this world. So let your light shine before men that they may see their good, your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So what's the problem? It's not a problem with God. There's not a problem with the Spirit. There's not a problem with you. There's a problem with us not living by the Spirit that we have, at least that we proclaim to have. Let me read 1 Corinthians chapter 1 again, starting in verse 4. I always thank my God for you because of His grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in Him you have been enriched in every way. If He's called you to be His hands and feet, He has equipped you to do it. Don't let the devil ever tell you, I can't do that. I don't have that gift. That is a lie. That is not from God. If you feel called to go talk to someone about Jesus, you have everything that you need to talk to them about Jesus. If you simply tell them how excited you are, they have to, 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 to rationalize that. If you can't quote them a Bible verse, you just say, I love Jesus because He changed my life. They cannot deny that. And the more that your life has changed, the more that they will question whether that is truth or not. There is no greater living testimony that somebody was, was this way is now this way. Whether it's as simple as she was mean as a snake and now she's nice as can be. Something happened. Jesus happened in their life. And no one can deny that. The problem is when we don't walk in step with the Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 1.10, Paul says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters. I'm making every plea that you understand this. And I'm going to do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there be no divisions among you. I guarantee there, there are divisions among you today in the body of Christ. I know there are. But here's how you should be that you all be perfectly united in mind and thought, that you realize that you're saved for a purpose, that Jesus Christ is your Lord, not just your Savior, that you have a spiritual gift, maybe more than one spiritual gift, and the gift that you've been given is to help someone else to build them up so that we can better proclaim the message of Jesus Christ. If we're on that mind and thought process, then guess what? We're going to love each other a little more, have a little more unity, and draw people to Christ more. Wow. Because He is going to return. That's why we light these Advent candles. He came as the Old Testament said He would. People didn't recognize Him. And as in the days of Noah, people will be eating and drinking and not knowing the destruction that's coming until it comes. Jesus Christ will return. And instead of one man preaching in the, in 
to the world, Noah, Jesus Christ has all of us. Greater things we will do if we let the Spirit do it in us. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says, A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help one another. Write that verse down so you know that I'm, I'm not telling you different. Oh, it's up there. A spiritual gift is given to each of us. Why? So we can help each other. That's the problem in the church at Corinth. They said, I have spiritual gifts, but I'm not about to help that person. I've got this spiritual gift, and look who I am because I have one. <laughs> hypocrite, hypocrite, hypocrite. Right? goes on to say in chapter 12, verse 31, So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts, but let me show you the best way of all, the most excellent way. Love. Love one another. Paul's words are echoing Jesus' words so much, but still his people, those who proclaim, those who are, however you want to look at it, are still struggling with their flesh when they don't need to if they would just die to the Spirit. Why do you think I say that this is up here? If anyone wants to come after Jesus, doesn't say accept Jesus, come after Jesus, follow in His footsteps, he must deny himself. Then he must take up his cross, his instrument of suffering, pain. It's not your life anymore. It's God's. You've been purchased. Then follow Jesus, and you will be fishers of men. Wow. What a great promise that we have for us. 2 Corinthians 5, and then I'm going to let our special guest talk here in a second. Verse 11 through 21. So we're to the second letter now that we have, possibly the fourth letter, of Paul continuing to address these problems in the church at Corinth. Paul goes back to the basics. Remember what the basics are from the Old Testament? Fear the Lord. If that's where you need to go back to to understand, God is God. He created you. You have no rights whatsoever not even the breath you breathe had God not desired to give it to you. You should be thankful to Him. You should honor Him. And the fact that when we rebelled against Him, and think about your own child, whatever you need to do, that we rebelled against Him and what He did is sent His Son to die in our place to empower us to live so we can live that holy life. And one day we will be in heaven and there won't be any of this sin anymore. None of it. then the beginning of wisdom is fear of the Lord. So in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 11, that's where Paul starts. Since then we know what fear, what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than in what is, what is in the heart. If we were out of our mind, as some say, Jesus freak would be your term today, and I'm glad when somebody calls me that because that gives me an opportunity to explain to them why. I don't take that as a, as a negative thing. If we are out of our mind, that's what some of the people are saying, Paul says, it is for God. If we, are out of, or if we are in our right mind, because we are, it is for you. We are bringing the truth to you. For Christ's love is what compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him. Another letter to another church who died for them and was raised again. So all these excuses we make don't really hold salt, do they? Verse 16, So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though once we regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, that means he's wrapping up what he's saying here, if anyone is in Christ, so that's the first thing that you need to answer, isn't it? Do you belong to Christ or not? Do you have the hope 
the peace, the joy that, you, that Jesus died for you to have. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Not some, all who proclaim his name. Verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us, Paul says it again, the message of reconciliation. Now Paul says it a different way. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. Four different ways at least he's saying it there. Do you get the point? If you belong to Jesus, you are his witness for what he's done in you to the world so that they can be saved also. And you have to train them up, not for just for salvation, but to be His disciple. That's what the Great Commission says. It says to train them up to be disciples, to follow in the same thing. So they don't just say, oh, I'm saved and it's great, but so that they carry it on. Yes, I want my children and grandchildren to be saved. But what I want more than that is to them to be a much mightier man or woman of God than I ever thought I was. That's what I pray for constantly. That... They can see Jesus in me, and it inspires them not only to imitate, but to grow to maturity much more than I ever will. Because that's what Jesus would want for them. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. My prayer for each one of you is that you realize the calling that you have, the new life that you have, the gifts that you have, the purpose and unity in this body of Christ, that you are the hands and feet to this world, that you have been given the message of re reconciliation, and that any time when you don't realize that, you get down on your knees and ask God to give you the power of His Spirit to increase your belief. Remember reading that in the Gospels? to increase my belief so that we can do those mighty things that Jesus said for us to do and so that we can live lives worthy. Kim?